Hello everyone and welcome to another Scots We Hate podcast and tonight I am joined by writer and journalist Olga Voitas. Hello Olga. Hello. And thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me and I'm very impressed that so far I have managed not to break the internet. <laughs> well, let's hope you don't get blamed for that. That's uh... <laughs> Um, so we're going to talk to you, first of all I should ask, how are you getting on with this whole strange lockdown situation, which is why we're doing this over video? Well, you would think it is, you know, the dream life for a writer, that basically, you know, you're stuck at home all day, and I, I work from home anyway. I have been going absolutely stir-crazy. It's the fact that, you know, you're not allowed to go out except once for exercise. And I'm going, that's inhumane, that's ridiculous. It's only letting me out once. And now Nicholas said you can go out as often as you like to exercise. And I'm going, no, no, you're you're fine. It's okay. I'll I'll just I'll just stay in. But I find a lot of the time my brain has gone to porridge. I'm really finding it all very strange and weird. Yeah. I think the further it goes on, at the beginning, um, and I'm very lucky I've been able to work mostly from home, but at the beginning you kind of think, oh, this is, I'm working from my own desk and all that. And then as it's gone on, you think, oh no, really, I need to, I need to uh, get out a bit more, basically. Um, so we're going to talk about your uh, books. I'd say books plural, because the most recent one is Miss Blaine's Prefect and The Vampire Menace. Mm -hmm we have here since we're on video I thought we would do the show and tell lovely yes and but I think with you it might be worth going back to the golden samovar which was the original one so we can talk about um the whole character of um well of Miss Blaine's prefect so let's start with how these books kind of came around well, the really spooky thing is, as you say, I'm a, I'm a journalist as well as a writer. And the really spooky thing is that I started writing it because I was completely stressed out by the news. <laughs> Little did I know then <laughs> what the we know now. <laughs> uh, basically, I am a complete news junkie. And, you know, I watch all the news broadcasts and I'm one of the few people that still goes around buying all the newspapers. And I was just, just getting more and more fraught. We're talking, broadly, we're talking Brexit and Trump. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, you know, things just don't get worse than that. And as I say, little did we know. Anyway, I was finding that I was actually getting stressed out when I was reading as well. Okay. And, I, you know, I do read crime novels and I was getting stressed about bad things happening. And I decided that I wanted to write something that was effectively a comedy where there was absolutely no jeopardy. Um, you will know that in a book what happens is the, the protagonist goes on a journey, whether literal or metaphorical, they have changed by the end. I wanted something where the character had not changed one iota <laughs> at the end. And what was really driving me was thinking of something like Jeeves and Wooster, mm -hmm. where yes, you know there's yeah, a lot of there's a lot of pressure going on in that. There are things that are happening, but you know it's going to work out. So I wanted something where you knew everything was going to be fine. And the loveliest thing that was ever said about the book was, um, I'll, I'll backtrack in a minute and tell you about the Scottish Book Trust. But I got a mentor from the Scottish Book Trust, uh, Linda Cracknell, the oh, author, yes. who is just superb. And what she said about the book was, she said, this is Anna Karenina as written by P.G. Woodhouse. And I just thought that was the most magnificent thing to say. And that was exactly what I was trying to do because I was wanting something where you could just relax. You knew that nothing awful was going to happen. And I have to say awful things do happen. And the, you know, there's a fair number of deaths and so on. But, but the protagonist, Shona McMonagall, it just all goes, completely bypasses her and she basically goes singing and dancing through life and nothing phases her at all. It reminds me a little bit of when, when uh, Jerry Seinfeld and Larry David were going to start Seinfeld's show. They said, this show we will have no hugging and no learning. And there's a little, <laughs> bit, of, a little bit about that I think, going on. Yes. yes. Um, it's that description that Linda gave is it's absolutely spot on and it's more pithy than this because I was thinking that the, the books can be described as 
time traveling detective comedy literary crime fiction and there's, there's everything is kind of in that i'll definitely go with that that's lovely <laughs> but so but there is a, a, a it's a lot of things to kind of cram into it but the underlying thing for me is they're a real pleasure to read but you can't help shake the feeling that they were a real pleasure to write as well I was doing them as escapism yeah. and I had always wanted to write a novel. I've had a, a number of short stories published. I'd always wanted to write a novel and had no idea how to set about it because with a short story I tend to find I keep that in my head. Um, I don't know if this is going to sound weird but I actually write stories while I'm walking. Okay. And I don't mean doing anything dreadful like walking up a hill or anything like that. I don't like nature. Um, so what I mean is literally just walking around streets, but I'm not paying attention to where I'm walking. There's just something about the movement that gives me ideas. So I would almost write a short story in my head while walking and come back and effectively transcribe it onto yeah. the laptop. It would all be in my head. And you can keep a short story in your head. Um, but with a novel, I just didn't know what to do. And the breakthrough for me was the absolutely superb Scottish Book Trust, which has a new writer's award. Yeah. And I got one of the new writer's awards. The fantastic thing with that is they, they give you some money. So that let me buy out my time as a freelance journalist. Then the real breakthrough was that they sent me to live in a recycled freight container for a week. <laughs> And this was in the wilds of Argyllshire in February, where you could basically see the sleet and the snow going past. Um, there was nothing to do except stay in the recycled freight container and write. Right. And I prefer to write at night. And that's something that you can't really do in real life because you have to be up and dressed yeah, and sure. so on. But, but this, since I was in a recycled freight container, it didn't matter. So I wrote during the night and I slept during the day and it was self-catering and I had two big bags of Scots porridge oats with me. So I lived on porridge oats and wrote and at the end of a week I had 22,000 words. Wow. And I'd never written that many in my life before and I've got a wonderful writing friend who says you can edit rubbish but you can't edit nothing. I think that's and it might have been 22,000 words exactly and it might have been 22,000 words of rubbish but it was a starting point. And then the real help was that I got four meetings with Linda, who basically, she had shifted from writing short stories to, to a novel. Mm -hmm. And my feeling was, if I tried to edit the novel, it would be like a game of Jenga. If I moved one word, the entire thing would just collapse oh, inwards, yeah. and that would be it. And I was petrified, I didn't know how to touch it. And she basically helped me to, edit it safely by going to, you know, going to a bit that was completely wrong and basically changing that. And that then had a knock on effect on other bits, but it wasn't destroying the whole thing. There were still bits that were right that you could yeah. keep. So she was just fantastic. And then um, the glorious Saraband uh, published me under their imprint of Contraband, which is their, their crime and mystery imprimatur. And what's wonderful about that is I've got the same publisher as Graeme McRae Burnett, <laughs> which I've been dining out on ever since. Uh, well, and, and a great publisher they are as well, absolutely. Yes. Um, so I'm really interested in that because I think that's maybe something that quite a few writers maybe struggle with is that move from writing short stories to writing uh, the novel. And what you might expect perhaps is that the first attempt at a novel is a series of vignettes that are often short stories put together. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. your books aren't like that. You know, it is absolutely a, a kind of um, chain of uh, right through to the end. So how did you shift that in your head? Was it a change of mindset or was it just something that Linda was able to practically take you through? I am very intrigued by, by you saying that because in fact they were written as a series of vignettes. Oh. Um, I, as I say I had never, I, I didn't know how to tackle such a long narrative and what I was drawing on predominantly for the first one was Tolstoy. Right. And because of that, I knew I wanted three scenes. I wanted a grand ball, 
-hmm. I wanted a jewel in the forest and I wanted a scene on a train because you had to have a scene on a train. So I had these three scenes and I wrote them and I didn't even know what order they were going to come in. So I had these three separate scenes and then I sort of had to do the joining up bits. And I'm, I'm intrigued that, you know, from what you're saying, it sounds as if the joins aren't all that obvious, no, which is no, terrific. I don't think they are. I mean, now that you say that, you can kind of look back at it and say, oh, it's almost got three act, like a play or a three act play. But it didn't feel that way when I, when I was uh, reading it. Um, so going back to my slightly chunk, clunky uh, description, did you always have these different aspects that you were going to put, like the, the time travel or the, what well, sounded like it was always going to be crime of some kind, uh, you wanted to make it light, dark and funny, but you know, it's a lot to pack into, particularly in your first novel. Well, what I was wanting was um, having a heroine who really, you know, she has had this superb education, she knows absolutely everything, but she is a total numpty. <laughs> so, you know, I was wanting, I was wanting something that would show off her knowledge, you know, mm -hmm. that she could, because she does know about everything. The, the running gag in the first one is that she doesn't know what year it is. Mm -hmm. So she keeps finding, she thinks that she turns up in Imperial Russia, has no idea what year it is. And she thinks it looks unprofessional to ask anybody. So she tries to piece it together. So things happen and you can see her calculating, well, this must be before 1863 if this has happened and this must be after 1811. Um, so there, there were things like that that I was wanting to get in specific dates. There is, it can actually be worked out what date the book takes place in, but you'll have to send me a bag full of used fivers before I tell you. <laughs> it, it doesn't surprise <laughs> me. I think there's probably quite a lot of in jokes and little uh, um, puzzles to solve in there, would I be right? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> I, I thought so. Um, and also, that, you know, you're saying that the, the first book is kind of um, influenced by Tolstoy and the second one is a take on Dracula. Yes. And uh, not just Dracula, no, because it, it's that. partly on Dracula, but the, the other thing is that um, I spent a year in France as an assistant. Um, I, I taught, in a, taught English in a French school and I was so excited about going to France because I was thinking the old alliance, yeah. you know, Scotland and France, like that spiritual home, just fantastic. Went to France, discovered nobody in France had heard of Scotland. Nobody in France had heard of the old alliance. <laughs> it was just me. Um, when I went there, um, in order to teach, I had to get a residence permit and I had to get a work permit. Right. But I couldn't get a work permit until I got a residence permit and I couldn't get a residence permit until I got a work permit. Right. Um, so I spent about the first three months going backwards and forwards to the police station until eventually things coincided and I was getting my documentation and they wrote down my name and then they wrote Angleterre. And I said, excusez-moi, I said, <laughs> ce n'est pas Angleterre. And I said, it's a cost. And they all went, Moo. and I go, no, 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 you write down a cost. So they did write down a cost, but they put it in inverted commas. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly thought it was just a configuration of words, that, of letters that I just put together. <laughs> meant nothing oh wow that's something to kind of bring you down nationally isn't it <laughs> where you're like okay so that's the other thing in in the vampire menace is that they have no idea about scotland and she keeps they keep calling her english and saying she's come from england and she keeps desperately trying to tell them they're having none of it but in both books there's a real sense of one um you're wanting to kind of explore the genres but also some of the kind of myths behind it, because particularly in The Vampire Menace, um, you kind of look at the Dracula myth and talk mm -hmm. about where it was written and you have links back yeah. to Scotland and, the, you know, and, and lots of different things that are fascinating. Is that something that you kind of wanted to do is kind of get behind the, a bit like a, um, Shona, you can kind of get, you, you have the knowledge of what actually went on or you know, where these stories actually came from. Yes, yeah, so a wee bit, because also I, I actually went to Aberdeen University, so that's oh, okay. why there's a, a sort of Aberdonian chunk in that. 
um, because Slane's Castle is what influenced Bram Stoker to, to write Dracula. I mean, there is absolutely no doubt about this, but the only place that gets any credit is Whitby. And everybody knows about Whitby and Dracula and Bram Stoker, but it is actually Slane's castle because he would have his holidays up in Port Errol and he visited the castle because there's a room in it that he describes in the book. It's an octagonal room um, with no windows. So it's clear that he must have gone um, into Slane's castle while it's now a ruin, but you know, while yeah, it was still yeah. operating. And unfortunately, nothing has ever been made of that in the Northeast, although a lot of people in the Northeast do know about this link. Um, so I wanted, I wanted to have that. There's also other things, um, you know, I've got Debussy in it as well. Oh, sorry, I was going to backtrack slightly and say <laughs> it is absolutely true that one of um, Bram Stoker's key sources, apart from Slane's Castle, was the woman from Airdrie, mm -hmm. who wrote a book about Transylvanian myths. And that was his key text that he drew on. And as Shona will tell you, never trust a woman from Airdrie. You know, so you know, obviously everything that he'd read in that was complete nonsense. So that was, you know, if you like, a wee in joke that uh, you know that that was what it had come from. But also things like um, Debussy. Debussy genuinely was a real lad, and he he apparently was attracted attractive to women of all ages you know, sort of from teenagers to nonagenarians, they all absolutely fell for him. And he ended up, while he was married, he ended up wandering off um, with, with his best mates by the inn. Mm -hmm. And at this point, his wife went to the Place de la Concorde and she shot herself. And she didn't kill herself, but mm -hmm. they never actually managed to get the bullet out. And she had the bullet in her for the rest of her life, and he was off with somebody else. And frankly, I thought she should have shot him rather than yeah, herself. It's a terrible reminder of uh, just how things have gone. <laughs> so going back to the character, I mean, you talked about um, Shona McGonagall's education. Thanks. And at the heart of the book, if you like, is her disdain for the prime of Miss Jean Brodie. Yes. Um, so... Is this a personal thing or is this something that, because uh, you, I should say, you went to James Gillespie's school. I went to James Gillespie's, yes. I went to James Gillespie's, which is the school that Muriel Spark went to and that she wrote The Prime of Miss Jean Brodie about. Um, and again, there is absolutely no doubt about that. And she wrote it about her own teacher, um, who was called Miss Christina Kay. And she actually, later when she, was, when she was writing her own autobiography, she actually described Miss Kay as a character in search of an author. Right. And that was her primary school teacher. Um, now, Miss Brodie, as you know, used to go to Italy for all her holidays. Miss Kay went to Italy for all her holidays. Miss Brodie would go around looking at all the artworks. Miss Kay looked at all the Italian artworks. Miss Brodie was a huge fan of the black shirts. Miss <laughs> Kay was a huge fan of the black shirts and had a picture of the black shirts on her classroom wall. And the wow. clincher, Miss Kay called all of her pupils the creme de la creme. So that was what Muriel Spark had picked up in her primary school days. Now, when I was at, I was at school when the book came out, okay. and I was too wee to remember that, but I do remember when the play came out and when the fantastic film with Maggie Smith came out. Mm -hmm. And the school was absolutely outraged because there was just, there was no doubt that this was about Gillespie's and there was no doubt this was about Miss Kay. And at that point, there would still have been teachers at the school who had taught with Miss Kay, who remembered her. And they thought that, you know, she had brought the school into disrepute. And this was an absolute outrage. Now, um, the school has got a Muriel Spark building. It has got a Brodie's Cafe. They basically oh, really? can't get yeah. enough of her now. But at that point, they were just horrified by her. So I was thinking in terms of, you know, I, I took that from the, the character that she is just aghast that this terrible book has been written about her school. And of course, I have it still as the Marcia Blaine School for Girls, you know, that it, it is that very school, school. And she's just absolutely shocked by this. And the number of people who come up to me and say, so you don't like Muriel Spark? <laughs> and I, I have to sort of explain that your character is not necessarily you. And I think Dame Muriel is our greatest Scottish writer and I have nothing but admiration for her. 
and and a great example of that as well. You know, you couldn't possibly say, "Oh well, to Muriel's part, all these characters are you're yourself, are they?" You know, <laughs> that would be odd. I remember hearing a wonderful story about when she came to the Edinburgh Festival. That was um, Alan Taylor had got her along to the Edinburgh Festival, and tragically, I didn't manage to get a ticket. I think the tickets were sold out within a nanosecond of her yeah. coming. But I heard that at the end, um, one of the members of the audience had said to her, um, do you find your characters taking over? And there was a terrible silence. And then Dame Muriel said, how could that happen? <laughs> 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 I'm interested then, but what was the kind of general feeling in Edinburgh towards the book? Uh, because it seems to me, it's. I did a a film showing uh, in Edinburgh during the centenary year mm -hmm. and um, it was incredible because I'd also shown it in Glasgow years earlier and people in Glasgow enjoyed it and kind of laughed mm -hmm. in all the right places and clapped and all that but the Edinburgh audience seemed to know every single word. I mean there were people in the front row mouthing along to it. <laughs> it was honestly it was quite incredible. Um, so it does seem to me that it's got over any kind of um, a uh, anti a brody feeling to be warmly received. Oh, definitely. And I think the only anti brody feeling would have been within the school at that time because everybody else, um, we were, Gillespie's was in a very, very odd position because it was a corporation school, it was a state school, not a yeah. private school, but it was selective. Right. And that meant that the private schools looked down on us <laughs> and the other state schools thought we were snobs. So basically everybody hated us. We had no friends. So I think because of that, everybody else would think, oh, here, this is wonderful. Here's a, here's a book poking fun at Gillespie's. You know, we'll all have a read of that. But I think as well, people felt, you know, it is a very Edinburgh book. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a feeling of pride about that, um, and you you know the places that it's taken, you know that the, where the, the the narrative is, and of course now we've got trams again because Miss Brodie is always getting the tram. She's always leaping on trams to Cramond and trams to Churchill. Um, so I think there is a, a great feeling of affection for that particular book. Having said that, I. I, I think it is a terrific book, but I don't know that I would say it's her best book. It's certainly her best known book. Yeah. Um, yeah. But there is something very Edinburgh. And for those of us here, I think that makes it very special. Well, I think for, for, for a long time, that was the version of Edinburgh that people thought of when they thought of Edinburgh was, yes. the, was the walking through this, perhaps more from the film than even the book. But, you know, it was such a huge success that that's kind of what people thought. Yes. It's interesting that Muriel Spark actually didn't like the film right. because, they, as you know, they, the, the book is set in the 30s and she said it was too bright. She said the ah. colours were too dazzling. And I don't know if you remember, it starts off um, with Jean Brodie coming out of her house and her front door is scarlet mm -hmm. and she's wearing bright clothes and she leaps onto her bicycle and there's trees around, it's all very green and lush. And Muriel Spark was saying it would have been much greyer and muted, you know, and so she actually, I think, liked the, the television series with Geraldine McEwen better. Yeah, yeah, which is a terrific version as well. Mm. Um, I think the colours in the film, uh, I love the film, and I think yes. they are, they're there for a reason. I think, you know, mm -hmm. maybe that was part of the problem as well. Um, so then there was the, the, the because shown as a kind of, she's not an anti-hero, she's a reluctant hero, put it that way. <laughs> yes. um, I don't want to give too much away, but people were thinking, how the hell does she end up in, in Russia and why? Um, can you say a little bit about how the, the, the character ends up where she is? Well, it turns out that um, Marcia Blaine girls always believe they're there to make the world a better place. Mm. That is their raison d'etre. And she works now, she's, she's 50 something. Um, she admits to 50 something. I actually think she's fairly close to getting her bus pass, but she doesn't actually admit to that. And she's now a librarian in Morningside Library. And one day, Miss Blaine turns up and decides to send her on a mission. And what Miss Blaine has decided is that she is going to send her on a time traveling mission because then she can do good 
not only in her own era, but in another era. So basically, this is just doing even more good. And she's sent off on a mission, but the problem is she never quite works out what it is. She sort of makes an assumption, despite the fact that Miss Blaine has told her never to assume things, and she kind of gets it wrong. And yeah. even in the second book, she still, she never quite gets the hang of things. No, there's a lovely kind of, um, not a bumbling quality, but kind of almost falling into the right conclusion after making lots of, you know, <laughs> particularly in the new book, I think there's some lovely, uh, she makes lots of assumptions that turn out to be completely <laughs> incorrect. Um, and there's what I also enjoy, and you, you've kind of touched on it a little bit, is you uh, um, have shown a kind of having her own assumptions or at least following up on stereotypes of Scotland from different parts. Mm. So lovely, like you say, you never trust a woman from Airdrie. Uh, but, uh, and then there's like, a, oh, people in Glasgow are on that electric soup, which I had, haven't had the term electric soup for a long, long time. <laughs> and then, you know, in Aberdeen, they're all having uh, rowies and shortbread. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it, there's a real uh, joy in kind of, you know, not denying that these stereotypes and, and kind of types exist. And, yes, and, and the I, thing I, is, I, I think, think... Sorry, sorry. Andrew. I was going to say, I think she doesn't realise she is an Edinburgh stereotype. Yes. That's because she just say. thinks that Edinburgh is completely normal and everybody else is out of step. And you see her being precisely a sort of Morningside character, but again, she's completely oblivious to this. She just thinks that everything she does is right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, it's like, well, this is the, the correct way of doing it, but gently kind of poking... Well, she's not poking fun at herself, but of that whole kind of stereotype as well. It's, it's, it's really lo a really nice balance. Um, so it's been, the book's been really well received. Um, I'm presuming this is now a series. Was it always going to be a series? It wasn't at all, because as I say, I'd never written a novel before, didn't know whether I could do it, was just ecstatic when, when Saraban took it on. That was just so wonderful. Um, I was just overwhelmed by that so I wasn't thinking at all in terms of a series and I can't even remember I, I don't know whether it may even have been Saraban who asked whether this might go further but yes I think it is turning into a series and I, I do have some I do have some ideas for where it might go from now on. Because in a way your options are endless. You've got this fantastic character who can't time, so there's yes. no problem there, and you can put her into any kind of situation that you, you like. Exactly, yes. And you would almost say that would have been brilliant. If this had been a plan from the start, it would have been I perfect. Know. I know, yes. It's been pure serendipity. So I am... Um, where now the book has been out for quite a wee while so you'd been through all the kind of promotion and stuff off it had you or was there more not really because the book came out it was published i think it was officially published on valentine's day ah, okay and um i i had a launch i had a launch in toppings in edinburgh which was splendid and then I went to um, Bookmark in Blair Gowrie, which was ah, great. Good. Yes, yes. But there were a number of other things that have basically, sadly, fallen off the radar, which is a bit of a shame. Yeah. But What do you do? So this is extremely lovely to be here. <laughs> Appreciate <laughs> it very much indeed. Not at all. It's an absolute <laughs> pleasure. Um, and so you, but you've no idea, I guess, what I'm trying to say is, have you finished with a vampire menace and are you able to think about the next one or are you still kind of in the headspace of vampire menace i've got a secret life i can't remember if i've told you about my secret life or not no, I, I may not that. have done but basically i write a a cozy crime series this is for uh it's for a german company which publishes in german and in english oh. so i write it in english it gets published in english and then they also get it translated and it's it's published as an ebook and this is a series of novellas which are set in the cotswolds oh. so it's sort of midsummer murders type thing anyway when i when I completed the first one and sent it over, it was just about to be published, and they suddenly came back to me and they said, uh, Olga Voitas, uh, this is not an English name. And I said, no, no, you're right, not an English name. 
and they said, but you must have an English name because this is a quintessentially English series and it yeah. sounds a bit daft if you've got Olga Voitas on it. So um, I was named after my two Polish aunts. So I'm Olga Helena. So Helena is my middle name. And in, I grew up in Marchmont Road in Edinburgh. So I'm now Helena Marchmont, oh, who I think sounds very posh. I think mm -hmm. she sounds like the sort of lady who takes tea on the lawn and so on. So I have just, must be about two weeks ago, I finished the ninth novella in, in this series, and I'm just about to start on the 10th. So that has been occupying me, but I also have the cogs are going on in the background, and I'm thinking about Shona, and during my, during my one official walk a day, yeah, I think yeah. about what Shona might be up to. Um, how long have you been doing the novellas? That's really interesting. Um, I think, I can't remember when the first one actually came out. I started writing them, I think, at the end of 2018. Okay, fantastic. And uh, we said at the very beginning that uh, you're a journalist and news junkie, you said yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, interested to, to ask people who have worked in that business how they feel it is. Well, it's, this is probably impossible considering how we are at the moment. Mm -hmm. but, how you felt in general, perhaps before uh, all the COVID stuff kicked in about the state of journalism in the future? It's a big question, but. It's, it's very sad because I have always been a print journalist yeah. and papers really are just disappearing. I mean, I, I, think, I think it is only dinosaurs like myself who actually buy newspapers now. Um, I, I don't see young people buying them at all. Mm. And also, you know, if they're actually seeking a newspaper as a news source, they're just going to read it free online. I, I doubt very much whether they're actually going to go to any of the sites that you have to subscribe to. So, I mean, I, I do think print journalism is in its death throes. Um, I, I worked um, primarily for a, a newspaper called the Times Higher Education Supplement, oh, yeah. which was sister paper to the Times Educational Supplement, but dealt specifically with further education and higher education. So it dealt with colleges and universities. And we actually saw the decline quite a few years ago and turned from, we had always been a newspaper and we turned from being a newspaper into a magazine and it's highly successful and it looks like a magazine. It's got yeah. a lovely glossy cover and it's set out in that way. People will still spend money on magazines, but they will not buy newspapers. And I mean, that does make me terribly sad. And I also think, you know, particularly at a time like this where, you know, you're getting so much, I was, <laughs> this is going to sound daft, but so much genuine fake news, you know, it really yeah. is fake news. You really need properly trained journalists, people who know how to assess news and get it out there. I think it's really, really important when all sorts of lunacy is being spread about the, the internet. No, I couldn't agree more. I think, uh, uh, and that's, that's the problem. It's the, it's the lack of um, people having time to be journalists, to do their job as journalists. Mm -hmm. That is really kind of worrying. Um, well, that seems like a really down note to end on, but I've really, <laughs> really enjoyed our chat. Um, so, what, what have you been reading while you've been in lockdown? Is there anything you can recommend to us that you've been reading? That you've been reading? I can indeed. And in, in fact, I, I didn't know you were going to do this, but this is, this is entirely serendipitous. Um, a fellow... A fellow Saraband writer has this absolutely wonderful series set in the Iron Age, Mandy Haggis, and that's the first one. Yes. This is the second one, and the third one has just come out. It has. What a lovely cover it is, too. So the beautiful cover. So these are absolutely superb. So I've, I've been into that, and it's wonderful because, I mean, having this is the last one in the trilogy. Yeah. So this is what brings it together. So I have been reading that, and I've been so excited by it. It's just so beautifully written. It's, that's exactly what I'm reading at the moment as well. And oh, gosh. It's <laughs> such a pleasure to return to, because we should say it's set uh, pre-BC. Um, uh, it's in the Iron Age, that's right. And, yes. Um, a, 
it's just such a pleasure to go back and join these characters and see what yes. happens in the next. Um, and what I think, when I first heard about it, um, I actually thought, well, this is going to be dreary. And I thought, uh, quite a lot of historical novels I don't like because they're, they're so consciously historical and you feel it's not real people. You, you know, you, you feel it's, uh, oh, they, they just made sort of prototype people in a particular time. And these people are so human yeah, and she makes the world so alive. It's not, it's not twee, it's not, she gives you so much information, but it's not shoehorned in. Everything yeah. makes perfect sense. It's just, I just love the characters, as you say, and it's great to finally get the third book. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm, in a way, I'm going to be sad when it's finished because I want to, you know, I know it's a trilogy, but I'd like to spend more time with these people. But I am also looking forward to spending more time with Shona McGonagall when that time happens. Excellent. Um, I, I better get on with it then. With it, yes. Olga, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. And uh, we'll be back soon speaking to someone completely different. Cheers. Mm -hmm.